stuff to be really freely moving here. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sean. Thanks to the organizer. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to talk today about cellular determinants of spatial representation in the cortical hippocampal system. And there will be three parts to this lecture. In the first part, I will talk sort of about structure function relationships in the medial and torrinal cortex. And this is work uh, primarily pushed by Andrea Bogalossi, a postdoc in the lab. I will then in the second and third part, which are previous, switch to the hippocampus, where I talk about hippocampal activity, in particular play cells activity and silent cell activity and how it is affected by experience. And uh, finally, discuss the possibility that there might be an internal trigger for global remapping. And uh, these parts are done, were done by Albert Lee and Joe Epstein, Epstein and they were still in the lab. And this is currently as work underway uh, done by Moritz von Heimdahl, a postdoc who is also a poster here and who you should talk to for uh, more detail. Uh, so the study, the study of the cellular activity in the cortical hippocampal system, I think this has been one of the most fascinating uh, uh, stories in neuroscience in the last decades. Uh, it somehow didn't end up in the Nobel Prize yet, but uh, who cares? Uh, uh, what was so stunning about, about the work in, in cellular neuroscience of the hippocampal system is a, is a series of discovery. And a, the sort of first discovery was uh, the discovery of blaze cells by O'Keefe and Dostrovsky, then uh, head direction cells by Toby and Miller, Muller, and finally, uh, sort of uh, the discovery of uh, grid cell uh, activity by uh, the Morses and their colleagues. So why were these uh, discoveries so important? And why is it such a success story? The, the reason is that sort of the, the activity in, in, the, in the hippocampal system, sort of the cellular activity, it, it was just unexpectedly abstract and, and explicit, sort of this idea of a cell uh, firing in a certain spot and another cell firing in another spot. It really made it possible to think at a neurophysiological level about the idea that the animal was using a map. And uh, there was, be before that, uh, there was uh, sort of behavioral evidence to suggest that rats, rodents can do map-like navigation. Then when, when people discovered these head direction cells, uh, 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 Taube, Muller, uh, it sort of became actually difficult to think that the animal is not using a map. Yeah? Uh, so uh, it, the first there was this correlates, the blaze cells, but uh, then when you find things that look like a compass, and that, that's what these cells do, it's actually, it would actually kind of be surprising if the animal would not be um, using map-like navigation. Then again, grid cells, I think they, they did another job, at least for me. And uh, there, there was a debate uh, started off by the discovery of O'Keefe. He suggested that blaze cells are part of an internal construct, an internal spatial uh, uh, representation system that the animal applies to the world to sort of break it down and make explicit uh, 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 representations. And he had a lot of emphasis on the idea that this is something that is inside the animal. Now, people didn't want to believe that. In particular, psychologists, they have a very hard time with the idea that an animal is not empty. Yeah? They think it learns everything and stuff. Yeah? And I think that's sort of where, where grid cells uh, came along and el eliminated another large class of theories. Sort of obviously, an animal has never seen a grid, right? This, these firing patterns, these hexagonal firing patterns, uh, uh, sort of iterated through space. This is something a, a rat has never seen, so it's not a goddamn memory. It's not something the animal acquired. It's an internal system, much like predicted by O'Keefe. So, okay. The cellular activity in the cortical hippocampal system, it's fascinating, it's rich, it's explicit. Turns out uh, uh, it's very inspiring. A huge amount of work uh, was done to, to sort of understand how the system works. Here I have an anatomy diagram. You don't need to understand that in detail. Sort of blue structures are structures where we found head direction cells, where people found head direction cells. Here, yellow, blaze cells. 
uh, crit cells uh, are here in pink, uh, were found in enterhinal cortex, but turn, it turns out that they are also in the post subiculum and the parasubiculum, which is not uh, depicted here. So uh, there, there was a lot of anatomical work uh, uh, triggered, even more so, and many of people you will know that or may have contributed, it, there was a huge uh, uh, set of of models triggered to explain how the animal blakes, makes plague cells and how the animal makes uh, uh, these uh, spatial representations. So we have, we have literally hundreds of models for how these cells come about. Now, being an experimentalist, uh, sort of uh, what I see as a challenge then is to eliminate these models, yeah? to reduce them ideally to one. Uh, uh, this is not very at. Uh, we still have hundreds of models. Uh, uh, a lot of models are compatible with the data, and, and uh, this is something not so easy to understand. Uh, when you think about the fact that we, we, under, we, we have studied these cells like hell, there are thousands and thousands of studies. Uh, why do we have so many models? Why do we have so many alternative uh, explanations? I think a major reason is that we typically know relatively little about the individual cell under study. And uh, this is both true sort of for the synaptic events that contribute to blade cell, grid cell, head erection cell activity, and for the microcircuits. And that's sort of where our work is focused on. And today I want to uh, talk about hippocampus and interrhinal cortex. Uh, Interrhinal cortex is an interesting place, head direction information, which is very heavily linked to the vestibular system, which scans from here, yeah, uh, uh, is integrated, and we, we see here in the interrhinal cortex for the first time sort of uh, uh, allocentric coding, sort of uh, uh, spatial responses that are not uh, egocentric, like, like the ones that we would find in the sensory cortices. Uh, and uh, then I will also talk about the hippocampus, uh, which has this uh, special ability to sort of form very memories very fast, uh, uh, sort of in single trial learning. Okay, uh, why is it so difficult to, why do we know so little about the individual cells we study? I think the reason is that uh, most of our techniques use, uh, deliver only very, limited information about the single cells. So we can extracellular record from awake behaving animals for decades, but we typically could not identify these cells and could not identify the microcircuits. And that's something that uh, Andrea Borgalossi addressed. So he used a special uh, micro drive that was friction based that we would implant on the animal uh, because there's a lot of friction between the pipette holder and the pipette guide, uh, the thing is very stable in place. He would approach a cell, he would uh, stain it, uh, and then cement everything in place and let the animal run around. And this cementing in place strategy is also something that we use. Uh, uh, it gives a lot of additional stability, uh, and it's also a strategy that we use for the patching that I will talk about uh, in, uh, in about uh, 15 minutes. Now, the way we do the experiments as yet, and all the data I will talk about today come from formats where we anesthetize an animal, we, we then stain a neuron, or we patch a neuron, uh, we give the animal an antidote against the, against the uh, anesthesia and we have it run around and then look at spatial correlates of firing. Now this format is, has its problems because the animal first gets the anesthesia, then it gets the antidote, so when it's waking up it's full of drugs. The behavior is quite uh, variable. The reason why we do it is because it's easy. Before Andrea sort of started to do this, uh, there were maybe in the whole history of neuroscience, I tried to count it, there was something then less than 50 cells identified in freely moving animals. And uh, Andrea, he has now identified about 100 cells already. And actually more people, in particular the Klaus Berger group, uh, is now also uh, coming, uh, coming up with identified cells from freely moving animals. So we think this is something where we'll have a lot of movement. <coughs> At the same time, we are trying to improve these experiments. We try to, uh, in this format, we just get a single cell per animal, or actually, to be honest, it's more like half a cell per animal because not every experiment works out. We're trying now to improve this, to get several cells 
uh, per animal to do it in fully awake animals uh, and uh, to have animals that are trained to run around because this leads to better spatial discharge uh, properties. Uh, this is underway, it's promising. Uh, the cost is that it makes the experiments even slower. Good, so now we're gonna use this technique and uh, ask uh, how how do microcircuits of cells in the entorhinal cortex look? In particular, uh, we, we are interested in head direction information and crit cell information. The idea was that, uh, that sort of these cells are mixed in entorhinal cortex and we're gonna evaluate this idea on the basis of our uh, evidence. Uh, before I really get into it, I, I wanna give you some background on, uh, on the anatomy of these structures. So, in particular in the human, here you look at the temporal lobe of the human, here would be the occipital lobe, here would be the frontal lobe. So this is the entorhinal cortex of the human. Uh, this brain structure is incredibly patchy. Yeah? Sort of there are islands, half a millimeter islands or so, that contain about 3,000 cells. In each hemisphere we find one to 300 of these little islands. In between there are basically zero cells. So as far as I know, this is the patchiest cortical structure that has ever been described. Uh, now, because it's so stunning in, 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 in humans and monkeys, uh, 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 it was first actually in the original publication that was saying that there are no patches in red entorhinal cortex. Turns out when you look closely at it, you find that it's also patchy. And what is very interesting, uh, so you see certain spots of cytochrome oxidase activity in layer two. This would be a, a section through entorhinal cortex, dorsal being here, ventral being here. Uh, uh, this is layer two, the dark region. This is a major output layer of the entorhinal cortex. In this area, the outputs come from the superficial layers, yeah? And it, it projects to the, uh, the layer two cells, in particular project to the dentate. Uh, so uh, what was particularly interesting here is that we found differences in the patches uh, when we went from dorsal, where the patches are often very small, to ventral, where the patches are large. And that was interesting to us because uh, uh, the, there was evidence from, from multiple sources, first anatomical evidence from Menowitos group uh, and uh, later physiological evidence from, uh, from the Moser group that there are functional differences here, namely the ventral, cord, the ventral entorhinal cortex being uh, sort of concerned with large spatial frequencies, having big distances, several meter distances between firing spots of grid cells, and, uh, and the dorsal uh, parts being concerned with sort of smaller spatial distances, having sort of firing fields that are sort of 10 to 30 centimeters apart. Now, what we also found is that there is not just one type of patch, but that there are sort of multiple types of patches, small ones and larger ones. These larger ones, we later understood, are related to the parasubiculum, and I talk about these in a bit more detail. So these patches are, 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 were very intriguing to me because I worked with patchy structures before uh, in, in, in like red barrel cortex. Uh, I have to say that we still don't understand the functional uh, significance of these patches uh, uh, all that well. Uh, the reason is, as far as uh, I'm concerned, that we have uh, uh, too few techniques that allow us to relate sort of cellular activity to, to individual patches. So we made progress on describing these patches in the red. Uh, we found that uh, actually Multiple different stains reveal, uh, so sort of this is a stain for cells, a nissle stain. This is a, a, a CHET stain for acetylcholine S transferase, a uh, 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 sort of uh, um, cholinergic uh, enzyme uh, that, that is involved in cholinergic action there. And uh, cholinergic action we know is very closely tied to thetarism uh, or cytochrome oxidase. Stain. So if you look at these different stains, they all reveal the same kind of patterns. Uh, sort of, for example, these three patches we see in all, we see in cell density, metabolic activity, as, uh, cholinergic activity, 
So we, 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 we have now a better take on what these patches are. And from doing these multiple stains, our estimate of how many patches there are came down. We first thought it was several hundreds. Now we think sort of in the upper third of the MEC, we have maybe 30 uh, of these patches. Uh, we think there is about 200 cells per, per patch. Yeah, it's a, a reasonably small number and quite different number from the 3,000 cells per patch that we would find in the humans. Uh, what is also intriguing to us is that we find patches not only in the interrhinal cortex, but also in the, in the structures that project to them, uh, like the post and that the, there are a lot of structural similarities. The patches, much like in the interrhinal cortex, are also restricted to the superficial layers. They also have size gradients in dorsoventral, and we, we think this is something that iterates in cortex uh, and is uh, a feature that uh, uh, is very typical for, for cortical processing. As far as I know, we don't uh, have any evidence of patchy structure in, in, in hippocampal system or, or very strong patches. Good, now what's happening in these patches? What, what do we see when we identify cells there? So uh, here is a recording from a, a layer two cell that we identified. We have the animal run around in an O maze and what we find, we find sort of multiple firing spots uh, uh, where the cell is particularly active. In the corners here, the cell actually fires, uh, fires basically uh, no spikes at all the five turns that, we that, that the animal made. And at these spots, uh, we have then other spots where the animal fires uh, most of the runs. Okay, this is similar to a, a, a grid cell in a, in, a, in a linear environment. We haven't done uh, this, we haven't studied these cells in an open field where you see the grid pattern better. And the reason is that we typically do not get uh, uh, good enough spatial coverage with our animals who just woke up from anesthesia. They run for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but for a grid cell, for, for sort of robustly seeing this grid pattern, you really need the animals to have uh, run like hell, and uh, uh, we don't have that, so we, we restricted ourselves to these linear mazes where we can assess the spatial modulation better. A very typical thing is that these layer two cells show very little head direction modulation. Yeah, they are sort of not directionish, and uh, they are very strongly cedar modulated. Uh, okay. Now, uh, how do other cells look like? Uh, I think I'm actually running late on time. We skip this sort of the, the, the layer three cells uh, look similar uh, uh, to the layer two cells. In the deep layers, we often find silent cells. Yeah, uh, or We were very puzzled by the large fraction of silent cells. About half of the cells are silent in, 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 in the, under our experimental conditions. And we initially thought that it's related to experience. We see in some cells an experience effect so that when the animal knows the place better, they fire more. But it's not uh, as robust as we initially thought. Uh, actually, many cells also would fire more in an unknown environment. So we, we're not totally clear about that. What is striking is uh, the, the architecture is very different from the layer two cells. The layer two cells actually made only very moderate local connections, yeah, and uh, quite restricted connectivity in the superficial layers. In the deep layers, which actually receive the hippocampal feedback, uh, there is very rich uh, local connectivity. Uh, so we think that the microcircuits of these deep layers that get hippocampal feedback and the superficial layers are very different. Another thing that is very interesting is that uh, these cells, basically the layer five cells, we never saw them connect to these uh, big patches here. Now, what's happening in these big patches? Uh, in these big patches, we, uh, we found uh, a lot of head direction cells, yeah? And these cells are strange cells, often very, uh, very small cells. They very much restrict, respect the borders of these big patches, yeah? So we think there's these, these big patches, the par parasubicular big patches, they have very, very sharp borders. So the cells never cross, uh, uh, the dendrites basically never cross this border. And we think it's one of the hardest borders in the, in the uh, red uh, uh, cortex. Uh, 
Now, these cells have a very interesting axonal architecture. First of all, they make a single ex uh, axon that goes sort of, uh, we find these cells at the border. This is a, let me, let me start here again. This is a side view. This would be dorsal. Uh, uh, this would be ventral. These are the different layers of the entorhinal cortex. And at the dorsal end of the, of the entorhinal cortex, we find these bigger patches. And, uh, and they send an axon to layer two. And actually, it turns out that they often send a select with their axon a single or two, in this case, uh, of these smaller patches. Now, this is one of the few things that we know uh, that might help define these patches. So they get, uh, they get very private directional input. So what, what that made me think in originally is that maybe these patches uh, can sort of, as an ensemble, they get specific direction information. And we think that the direction information, the head direction information, is involved in updating the map so that when I turn my head, yeah, not everything jumps, but it stays in place. So th we think that the head direction information might help rotate uh, these patches. And we wondered if individual patches might rotate. Now, from talking to uh, Edward Moser, Maybrit Moser, and people who record from, uh, from, from ensembles of grid cells, I, I'm not sure this is a viable hypothesis because they would typically say that sort of um, all the, typically most of the uh, grid cells would rotate together. It would not be, uh, uh, they have seen little evidence for restricted uh, 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 rotations. I went too fa fast here. Uh, I didn't go through the spike plot. So uh, this is a spatial modulation of the cell. It fires everywhere, but it's strongly modulated as a function of where the animal looks. So when the animal looks south, uh, it fires, and that makes it a head direction cell. OK. These cells, they do not just have this one ex axon that goes to the layer two, but they also have a very long axon that we call circumcurrent axon because it runs around the entorhinal cortex. Yeah? So it would connect actually many of these big patches uh, together. And uh, uh, another feature of these cells is that when we rotate the animal forced and in forced rotation, we see strong responses. Uh, so very much suggesting that these cells see a lot of vestibular input. So uh, a few concluding words on sort of the microcircuits of these head direction cells. So what we wonder if these circumcurrent axons uh, are involved in a, in a global computation of head direction. So uh, let me go back here. Uh, they have this axon that connects many, many of these big patches. And, uh, and we wonder if, if this circumcurrent axon is involved in aligning all the head direction vectors, right? A key thing about a compass is that the needle shows in one direction. Yeah? So we think that this might be uh, something uh, that enforces uh, uh, sort of a, a common head direction vector across the system. Uh, certainly when you deposit a little bit of dye in one of these bigger patches, uh, a stunning observation you make is the whole parasubiculum, uh, a huge structure, uh, uh, is, is filled with axons. Yeah? So there is very strong global connectivity. When you do the same uh, uh, experiment here, you find uh, there's a bit of local connectivity, but it's never that the entire uh, entire entorhinal cortex lights up. So there seems to be a big micro circuit difference in, uh, in the sort of the axons that these head direction cells form uh, compared to the more grid like cells uh, that we uh, discovered in other layers. Another feature of these cells is that we really have seen no deep layers associated uh, with, with uh, parasubicular patches. So, when you go back here, uh, these cells, uh, the, these patches are fat. They actually almost touch the surface. There's very little layer, one above. And they get very thin. And basically, we see very little layer 5 connected 
to it. And layer 5 is what gets uh, a hippocampal feedback, uh, the deep layers, in particular feedback from CA1, these cells do not seem to get. So what we wonder is, given the lack of feedback, maybe the animal doesn't memorize uh, this. Maybe the animal doesn't consolidate this. A key idea sort of in hippocampal research is that the, hippo that the hippocampal feedback allows the cortex to sort of uh, consolidate uh, memories about what the animal did. Now, what we wonder is, if there's no hippocampal feedback, or at least no CA1 feedback, maybe the animal doesn't memorize uh, uh, where it looked. It just memorizes its past. Actually, uh, this is a, a, a very good spatial, a, ver a very reduced spatial representation. But when we draw maps of where we were, we don't, we don't specify where we looked. Yeah? We just uh, specify uh, where we have to go. So uh, this is a, it's an idea, and it's maybe compatible with some other evidence that actually also shows a lack of replay in, in, in head erection cells, et cetera. Good. Uh, I spent quite some time now with structural function stuff uh, in, in entorhinal cortex. I also want to talk a little bit about hippocampal circuits. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, and this is work done by Albert Lee and, uh, and Sherm Epstein. And sort of a key thing about hippocampal representations is when you have the animal ra run around, you would have a group of cells that fire in certain places, so-called place cells, uh, uh, oops. Uh, certain place cells, and other cells that are, are silent. So now uh, uh, we investigated these cells with with uh, patch recordings, and I show you a movie of such a recording. In this case, a play cell recording. What you're going to see uh, uh, right-hand side is uh, the animal running around, and, uh, and left-hand side, uh, the, uh, the membrane potential. So we start with the animal sitting in the place field, and in black you're going to see uh, quite a bit of spiking. The animal sits here in the place field. There's a lot of very massive activity. The animal runs out of the place field, which is here, and actually the cell shuts down. This is the zero line. This is the membrane potential. Now it comes back into the place field, and you're going to see um, substantial activity. Yeah, the cell firing quite a bit. Uh, now we're going to show uh, a run where the animal runs, enters the place field from the other side, and you're going to see some mighty uh, spiking events, complex spikes, we think, uh, that is a gigantic depolarizations of the cell. Very, very impressive events. And I show you this now in a more formal format. This is the cell that I just showed you, the firing map of the cell. So the animal runs around here. The cell would fire only in this corner. And uh, uh, here we have uh, the animal covering some space. This is when it's in the gray area in the place field. And you see this massive uh, depolarization. In particular, we see these gigantic, uh, uh, huge bursts that look like they have a, a big calcium contribution, they can be so strong that it actually brings the cell into the depolarization block. Yeah? So uh, we, we do not see any sodium spikes anymore. And, uh, uh, and then uh, actually it relaxes again as the animal moves out of the place field. Uh, these big events, these big depolarization events, they were a surprise for me. I had recorded for years in in, uh, freely in freely moving and also in head fixed uh, cortical cells in these gigantic events, you know, that occur uh, when, when that are such that, they, 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 that the, the, the depolarization is such that the cell goes in depolarization block. I never saw this. And I, I actually, I only saw that in, in in vitro protocols when people did certain plasticity paradigms. I always made fun of it, yeah, because I thought these people have no clue. But uh, I changed my mind. Yeah? Uh, so in hippocampus, you really often see these gigantic uh, events. And we wonder if this is a difference of cortex uh, in hippocampus. In particular, uh, might be a, a cellular mechanism. These very massive uh, uh, depolarizations might be a mechanism for, for uh, instantaneous plasticity. Sort of the single trial learning that, that uh, hippocampus is good at uh, and uh, that you don't see like this. In, in cortex. Good, so this is a one class of cells. 
uh, that we see. The other class of cell that we see are, are silent cells. So if the animal runs around and there are very few spikes fired and, uh, and uh, the membrane potential is just rock steady. Yeah? Uh, so we, we recorded these first cells uh, in, in Holland uh, and uh, they still remind me of it. Yeah? The membrane potential is just flat. Yeah? It's just flat. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, this was kind of uh, surprising for us. Uh, most of all, we have very few cells, I should say, because these experiments, in particular the patching in the freely moving animals, is exceedingly difficult. But it looked very much like uh, uh, they, they come in two flavors, the cells. Yeah? Sort of the flat ones, the silent ones, and the ones with the peak. And, uh, and this is a, a finding that intrigued us a lot and that we worked on quite a bit. And uh, uh, what, what was actually uh, quite uh, special about this difference between play cells and silent cells is that we uh, then also discovered intrinsic differences between these cells. Namely, what we found is when we fire the cell, and actually, we would fire the cell when the animal is still anesthetized. It hasn't, it hasn't, it has never been in the maze that it's going to explore in, in, in 10 minutes when we wake it up, yeah? So we would patch a cell, we would inject current, and what we would find is that some cells give regular spiking patterns and other cells burst when we inject current. And uh, once more, the animal has never been in the place what we've then found is that the cells that would burst would, uh, would come out as play cells, and the regular spiking cells would come out as silent cells, uh, sort of suggesting that there were intrinsic differences. Uh, to me, it was a big surprise. For years, I suggested not to analyze this data, yeah, because ah, it's anyway from the goddamn anesthetized animal. We're doing here the awake stuff, uh, so why bother? But then in the end we did it and we found this difference uh, and uh, 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 very surprising to us. Another thing that was also very stunning and was you could anticipate this finding from uh, extracellular data, but I think it's more clear in our data, is that the cells very much come as they are. Sort of here we show uh, the first time the animal runs, and uh, we show the data from the entire session, and we show the membrane potential traces and the spiking, and what you see here, this is sort of, and we average across all runs, this is the first run, clearly uh, this here is a, is a place cell, yeah, uh, uh, it has a firing peak, so clearly this peak is already there, the first go, another even more dramatic case, the first the first time the animal runs through it, the entire session, they're just the same. So made, this made us conclude that the blaze cells, they come as they are. Yeah? So probably this whole blaze field formation then is not a, a, a learning business, yeah? as we would have, or as at least some uh, theories might have liked to think. And this is in line with what people had concluded from extracellular recordings earlier. Uh, good. Uh, Albert and Jerome, they then analyzed uh, more properties of these cells, more intrinsic properties, and found uh, quite a bit of further evidence for intrinsic differences between silent cells and play cells. And uh, uh, these were entirely unexpected, as I already said. Uh, even better, what, what Albert recently did and what was just published in Science is he fired cells at a certain spot and could show that he could switch on such a peak, yeah? that, he, that he sort of, by just a, a manipulation, intrinsic manipulation of the excitability of the cell, he can get place cells. And I think this will, will tell us much uh, about how these firing fields uh, uh, come about. Yeah? Uh, uh, these uh, are uh, un, uh, unpredicted findings, and we think that people need to pay more attention to cell intrinsic factors in, in place field formation and memory formation. And uh, uh, I want to leave it here with this. Uh, the last thing I will talk about is, is very preliminary. Uh, I sort of uh, talk about it because I, I, I was asked for an abstract and I somehow put it in. Uh, and I didn't want to didn't uh, leave it out. These are early days. Uh, and uh, it are findings on hippocampal um, 
remapping. Yeah? And what is glo global hippocampal remapping? This is something that was realized early on, but uh, then became more clear in the 80s, and it's simply the fact that when you have an animal in an environment A, you have a certain set of place fields, one in the corner here, one in one here or in the middle, one in the other corner. When you put it then, the animal in another environment, uh, you get a totally different set of, uh, of firing properties. Some cells uh, would totally lose blaze fields. Uh, some cells would uh, sort of have the blaze field uh, in a very different uh, uh, sort of global location. Uh, some cells would move the blaze field from the border to the middle. Uh, now, when you, when you then put it back into the old environment, uh, you see the exact same place fields as before, showing you this is not just random. And uh, now, this ability to totally rearrange, uh, totally rearrange place fields from one environment to the next, uh, uh, we think that this is part of the hippocampus ability to form highly context-specific memories. Yeah, it's just uh, the the, 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 the way the cells fire, and actually also the spatial relationship uh, of the cells, is very different. Uh, is, is very much context dependent. Now, this is very different from cortex. At least uh, so far, what, what people would say, what the Moses would say about entorhinal cortex, they would say, you put the animal uh, into two different environments, sort of the crits as a first order of, of approximation. They transfer. The spatial relationship of cells uh, stays the same. And uh, uh, so, so this, uh, this is a unique hippocampal property. Uh, I also say here it's very magic. What I mean by that is that it's deeply non-understandable. Yeah? Uh, so uh, in basically in cortex, what we are used to, the way we try to understand cortical circuits in, in uh, in, in, a, in a microcircuit fashion is that we make little wiring diagrams for, say, receptive fields. Yeah? There are like thousands of, uh, of models for how you wire up a, a V1 complex cell or a V1 simple cell or, uh, say, uh, the direction selectivity. And uh, this is what we typically do in sensory physiology. Yeah? We make little wiring diagrams uh, for, for how a response field, a response property comes about. Obviously, uh, in hippocampus, you don't need to draw little wiring diagrams for these things because they just do what they want to do. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, a very magic, very dark ability of, of the hippocampus. Initially, when I understood this, I decided never to work on hippocampus but I changed my mind. OK, so we uh, looked into this a little bit. And, and what we did is we, we um, let, me, let me give you a bit more of background. We, what we obviously were interested in is how were these novel uh, maps generated. And sort of a one classic idea is, is that there might be a pattern separation involved. Yeah? A pattern separation operation involved in the Lloyd gaps. And Moses have, and also other people have very nice evidence for that in cortex, when you put the animal in two similar but distinct environments, you get in, in the entorhinal cortex, you get quite similar receptive fields. When you then in the hippocampus in CA1, you get very different representations, just like I showed you. And uh, the idea is that maybe a pattern separation operation in, in, the, in the dentate uh, contributes to that. Now, we followed another idea. We followed the idea that uh, uh, maybe internal factors could introduce uh, remapping. We already saw that our place fields, uh, there seems to be quite some stuff in the cell. You know, its excitability seems to be a major determinant if it will form a, a, a blaze field or not. So what we thought is, hey, let's not look for this environmental stuff, but let's look for uh, uh, factors inside the animal. And what we looked at first was, uh, was dopamine, uh, which is thought to be a novelty in teaching signal. And uh, more interestingly, manipulations with the dopaminergic system greatly uh, are greatly disruptive to map-like learning. So 
Interestingly, uh, a, a task that doesn't really require a map, uh, like a team maze, go left, right. The animals can, can still learn when you put them full with dopaminergic agonists or antagonists. They, they still can learn these tasks. But when they need to use a map, like a Morris water maze task, they get very bad uh, under interference with the dopaminergic system. So what we did is we used uh, 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 what now turns out to be a very good or a very bad decision. We used a very dirty agonist, apomorphine. It acts strongly on, on, on the dopaminergic system, but it actually also acts on other um, other systems, uh, and maybe I come to talk about this, uh, and looked uh, how this would affect the hippocampal representations. And uh, what, what do we see here? Sort of the, we would uh, do the following experiment. We have an animal run around. We record from multiple cells in the hippocampus, and we see here blaze fields in this case. Uh, then we would inject a little bit of saline and what we would typically find is that sort of the place fields are kind of similar. There's still a spot here, still a spot here. They're not exactly identical because the runs of the animal are also not exactly identical and because these cells are, are quite variable in their discharge. Here again, another field that kind of stays uh, relatively similar. You still have this firing spot in the corner. You still have this firing spot. This firing spot was not there, but there is a lot of uh, similarity when we do this. When we then uh, uh, inject uh, uh, the apomorphin uh, at a high concentration, uh, uh, sort of one place field would be totally lost. Another one would remap. Yeah, uh, and uh, and it turns out that this is uh, is very prominent if you look at the population statistics. Uh, so when we do saline injections, basically uh, three quarters of the cell either fully stay or look sort of like they stay. And, uh, and I actually think if we would push our behavior, give do more runs, assess this more carefully, I still think this is an underestimate of the stability. But 75 to uh, actually more cells uh, would do the same. And very few blaze fields are, are sort of would appear or would sort of remap to other locations, etc. Now, when we when we inject apomorphin, uh, 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 a whole hell breaks loose. Yeah, very few very few blaze fields stay the same. Yeah, about 20 percent. Many remap. Uh, uh, Many appear, many assert or so, 25% uh, uh, are, are lost. So uh, this is uh, very striking. Now, uh, as I said, these were very preliminary findings. And there is much uh, about this uh, that we still don't understand. Uh, we, we are still not really clear what dopamine receptor subtypes are involved. Actually, when we give more specific drugs than apomorphin, uh, typically get less good effects. Uh, uh, so this is very uh, unclear to us. When we give antagonists to antagonize uh, 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 the dopaminergic system, uh, we, we also get quite variable effects. So this is stuff that is underway. Uh, uh, what I think it tells you, however, what, what is interesting here is uh, that you don't necessarily need two environments to make two maps. Now, I, I think this is clear from, uh, from our uh, data. So we have, we have here, th this is presumably not a pattern separation or uh, uh, operation because the animal is just running in the same uh, environment and we get two maps. Let me summarize here. Uh, I talked in the first part about uh, structural function relationships in the medial entorhinal cortex. We find different microcircuits for head direction cells versus cells that look more like grid cells. Uh, this is encouraging. I think also our methods to sort of derive structure function relationships in freely moving animals, they are improving. Uh, it's still uh, that we, from this, uh, we do not understand, obviously, uh, how, how it works. Or even the most obvious questions, what is happening in a certain grid patch? Uh, in one grid patch as opposed to the other, we still can't answer. Uh, I told you about the idea that 
hippocampal blaze cells and silent cells, that these cells are to some extent internally preset, that they, uh, that they arise uh, in just in no time. Uh, as soon as we measure, we, we see them. Um, and I told you about uh, uh, the idea that maybe there is an internal trigger uh, for remapping, or at least our, our data suggests this possibility uh, uh, as opposed to getting remapping exclusively from different environments. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a few questions. Yes, there's one here and then Christopher. Do you think that every silent cell has a chance to become a place cell? Or is there something like just naturally the difference between uh, place cells and silent cells? Yeah, OK. This is a very interesting question. And I oscillate on the answer. Uh, so from the extracellular, obviously, there are tons of remapping experiments done in the extracellular literature. And from these, you very much have the feeling it's random. Yeah. Uh, so it looks, you put the animal in another place, and then either it loses or it gets, so you get this feeling that it's random. Now, clearly, in our hands, it was very non-random, so that there were cell internal factors. So what I think is that maybe uh, this is part why we started to do these, these dopaminergic experiments. Maybe there are switches that uh, allow the cell to change its internal properties. Now, given the fact that Orbit just showed that, uh, uh, that you can, by just intrinsic, cell intrinsic ma manipulation, you can sort of switch on a place field or perhaps even switch it off. Uh, 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 so that makes me think that these cell intrinsic factors must be very important. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we don't know if some cells are sort of forever silent. Uh, it makes no sense to me, but. Uh, uh, yeah, who cares? Um, are there key morphological differences between the classes, like, or are they all the same, like cell type? Uh, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, so we should do this sort of the 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 play cell, silent cell data that I showed. These came from patching uh, experiments in the awake animals. It's exceedingly few cells. It's sort of uh, 14, 15 cells or so. Uh, and uh, only about half or so that we recovered, so there's no point making statements about that. As I told you, we are now quite a bit more efficient in, uh, in recovering cells with these juxtacellular approaches where we just stain the cell, uh, uh, and there we have high uh, uh, recovery rates, so it's clearly uh, traceable with these techniques, and uh, one, one, should, one should be able to find that. Other questions? Christoph? Michael, uh, did I understand you correctly to say that in the in complex event, uh, they are per direction selected? The only curve the animal enters into the field in one direction and not the other? No, 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 no. They uh, occur very much preferentially in the place field. Can you use field. the microphone, please? Yeah. I re I, I re Repeat the question. The question was if the, if the complex spike or these gigantic events are direction selective, if they would come uh, as in the movie only when the animal enters in one direction, the place field, or not. This is not the case. So they, uh, they occur more in the place field. The tuning, we have too few cells to really strictly compare the tuning. They, they, it seemed to me tighter, but uh, I'm not sure. So. Uh, we think that actually uh, these are very common events. I think that uh, if, if, if I understand the extracellular folks correctly, this is uh, really what is a complex spike, that the spike amplitude dives down so much. Uh, we think that the, the, the spikes in the classically described complex spikes, which are a fe the feature of the hippocampal pyramidal cell extracellularly, uh, is really uh, these big events. So we think that they are very common. Um, but uh, if you look at the extracellular literature, they actually have also done a very poor job. They should be able to pull this out where the complex spikes are, where the spike dives down most, uh, and it's not been done very well. Okay, one last question. Uh, Leno? Uh, 
Michael, thank you very much for a very nice talk in, in which you summarize some of the major debates in the field. It's also obvious from your talk that the reason for you to leave Rotterdam because things were too flat, too boring, which is still a pity, I think, but because it's a nice country. But I had a question about your uh, grid cells and the relationship with the heterection cells. So you initially started to say heterection cells are typically related to the post subiculum. Then you discovered this very intrinsic, uh, uh, intriguing wiring of the parasubiculum that seemed to yep. have this global effect yep. such that the directional system might be tuned into one direction. So do you know what the relationship is between the parasubiculum and the presubiculum? Have you seen any specifics about that? Or are the two independent? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we looked at this a lot. So, uh, so I danced around a bit ab about the question how, how head direction cells and grid cells are related because we are not really in a full position to compare our data to the ones that you and Edward and, uh, published. Uh, from the, from the, our reading of the, of the papers from, from your labs, it, it seemed like a mixture. We think that there are more head direction cells in the parasubiculum. We, 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 what is not so clear to us, what is clear to us is that in layer two uh, of enterino cortex, there are very few head direction tuned cells, and I think this is in line with the findings. What is less clear to us is uh, how many of the, of the really in the enterino cortex uh, head direction cells we have. Uh, we also seen these, but few. Yeah. Now, the interaction between the parasubiculum and the, and the enterinal cortex. So this circumcurrent axon, we think, makes a global connection across the parasubiculum. The interaction with the enterinal cortex is not global. It's a specific stripe. So we think that the, uh, let me go back to, to uh, maybe I have one here. Just a second, oh, it refuses to work. So, so uh, we think that there are these circumcurrent axons, this being the parasubiculum where we find a lot of head direction cells, this uh, uh, top few of the, of the enterinal cortex, yeah. Uh, and uh, we think that they make very specific connections to one stripe of the, of the enterinal cortex. And uh, we think this is probably where one uh, sort of spatial frequency is represented. Sort of the spatial frequency, as you demonstrated, uh, changes from ventral to dorsal, yeah? Uh, so we think that they, they, they make global interactions along here uh, and they make rather specific interactions with layer two along here. Uh, what we also saw uh, is that we, we get some feedback uh, from, that seems to uh, return this, in particular from layer three cells. Uh, uh, what, 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 what we don't quite understand is basically when we stain, uh, when we do sort of large scale stains here, we get, uh, we get exactly this connectivity the whole parasubiculum will fill when we do a small injection here. Uh, also, when we uh, also we would get from a specific site cells back labeled here. What we don't see so very much, uh, and what is what we don't understand, is the spec projection from layer three. We don't see these so very much, but we thought it were specific uh, specific cells uh, on both sides, uh, and uh, layer three probably uh, projecting back and. Uh, uh, parasubiculum very specifically uh, one one piece of one slice of enterinal cortex uh, um, probably one spatial uh, frequency all right so now we have time for a coffee break and the uh, parallel sessions will start again at 10:20 and let's uh, thank again our keynote speaker Thanks.